Okay, I want to point out one reference that will be a significant part of the second half of this um, lecture today. These are so far the collection that we're using. And this one right here is a, ninth, is a 2013 paper. Um, that just click on it, it comes up in high quality. And that will be uh, one to look at if for some reason the effort we've put into doing uh, the cyclic symmetry uh, six uh, here and the higher ones, uh, that's this uh, latter uh, one third of the lecture today. Um, that's, that's laid out in that text uh, uh, fairly clearly. Uh, so is this, I think, but they're di a little different in some ways. Now, what's new here today uh, is that every single line uh, on these little pages that were used to tell what's happening in the next few minutes of the lecture, every single one of them has this set of links. So clicking on anything that's got a purple line under it, um, that takes you uh, to a particular page uh, of the um, just of the area that, that, that we're referring to uh, for this lecture. And most of the uh, stuff that we're doing today uh, comes from uh, the group theory lectures, uh, one through thirty, basically, of, uh, about a year ago or less than a year ago. So uh, what this lets you do is um, instead of getting the page that we present uh, first, like this one right here, we just start off in this lecture looking at page 12. But if you click on this, you go back to where that discussion really begins, and so you get it in little pieces. I'll demonstrate this in a minute, but th th that's, um, that's what I think uh, we're going to try to do with all of our lectures now so that you can use it at home and uh, quickly uh, look at something that uh, you don't know the derivation of. We're, we'll try to have that derivation hiding in the background. And that's going to, I think, speed things up here as well. Uh, some of the group theory lectures went on and on and on and on uh, very long, and a lot of that length you might not find necessary. So this is a way to short circuit that, but it's also a way to retrieve it if you if you need it. Just to give you an example, uh, most of the stuff that we're, we're doing here makes use of a basic projection operators. And so maybe I should just go ahead and uh, here's our first order of business is, this, is the bilateral uh, uh, that's twofold symmetry uh, that we were talking about last time. There's a leftover a tunneling wave function going on the uh, far right-hand screen uh, as we speak, but the uh, idea of analyzing the uh, two, 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 two state systems, two level systems, eventually U2 systems, unitary uh, two systems, which we'll uh, bring up in more detail in the uh, next uh, lecture, uh, that, that is all um, based on uh, under, underlying the uh, idea of making projection operators for any kind of matrix. So uh, let me go ahead and just click on this and see if things are working this morning the way they should. Immediately I'm taken to the uh, lecture, uh, whatever that number is, the don't show it very well here, but it does show it up here, lecture four, and we're on page uh, 47. If I uh, back that page off uh, just one, uh, stay, just go one page uh, uh, above this, this is what we're talking about. This little formula here uh, that's based on basic algebra of equations and uh, gives you a projection operator as a product of the matrix minus the various eigenvalues, except for one, and that one is the one that labels the projector. 
and then the, the uh, algebraic normalization that we use here uh, is just the product of the difference between the eigenvalue that that projector is representing and all of the other eigenvalues besides that one. So this never gets to be zero. And the same uh, product is going on up here with the, uh, all of the, the, the product. You can't read this very well from where you are, but the product of epsilon, all epsilon m except the k that makes that projector. So once you do that, and this is just for this simple matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, which has no uh, particular interest physically, at least to, uh, to start with here, uh, then uh, gives you a, a, a set of matrices, P1 and P2, that are the ones that project the eigenvectors. But in fact, each of those matrices has some really nice properties, orthogonality and completeness is, uh, is uh, done algebraically, a very elegantly way. Uh, these then can be taken apart, that is factored very uh, easily in quite a few ways. One of them is just to simply cut them in half and put the ket and the bra uh, opposite each other so that you can use Dirac's notation that you're probably more used to. So th this is just uh, one, one piece of, uh, I should say, a very fundamental piece of this uh, thing uh, that we uh, are going to be using today, but we're going to let the groups uh, tell us where these projection operators are. Here, you're just given this matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, and has to find its eigenvectors. Yeah, Dr. Hunter, what are gauge scale factors? Like Say which factors? So the gauge scale factors. Oh, that is my favorite hobby, <laughs> <laughs> as far as this goes, okay? Uh, when you factor this matrix, Okay, uh, when you go uh, m 1 minus 3 and make it a half, okay, 1 half minus 3 halves, when you do that, and then uh, you've got this part right here also with a 1 half, you just read that off uh, there, you could put uh, any number you want, k1, here, as long as you divide by it here. So. Uh, I call these gauge scale facts. That, I mean, gauge and scale are sort of synonymous. Uh, so that is uh, uh, something that you can do. Now, as I say, the gauge scale factors that only affect it if you want to plot these vectors. That is, if you want to plot the cats, they're the blue vectors there. Okay, and notice they're not orthogonal because this isn't a symmetric matrix. Okay? And then uh, this guy right here, the things that are laying out as columns, those are the bra, that's the red thing uh, in Dirac's notation on the right, this vector here and this vector here, okay? They're not orthogonal either, but the second uh, bra is orthogonal to the first ket. See, there's a nice right angle between those two. And then the logical contrapositive of that is uh, also true. The second ket right here is orthogonal to the first bra. And that's the kind of orthorm orthonormality uh, that you uh, want to have uh, for any treatment of a linear system. This is totally um, before group theory comes to, to uh, be used. But boy, is it powerful for making group theory useful. That, that's really an essential uh, thing that I want to make sure uh, we get uh, clear right from the beginning here, okay? Because eventually uh, we want to make the uh, completeness relation, which is the sum of all of those projection uh, matrices, is equal to 1. And then that the matrix is expanded. This is called the spectral resolution or uh, uh, spectral um, decomposition of a matrix is what's going on here. And that's what we're trying to do to an entire symmetry group, an entire Lie algebra, entire uh, all kinds of things that are used in physics to describe uh, motion and symmetry and dynamics. Uh, all of them uh, are based on relations uh, like that. And um, when you do that, you take care of a lot of the things that made group theory annoying to the great masters of physics like uh, 
uh, I think Schrodinger called it the group and pesta. <laughs> okay, it's a disease, right? <laughs> he just hated the, <laughs> the, all of the complicated uh, mathematical terminology that comes with it, uh, based on mostly Herman Weil, but also there are a bunch of other people that were mathematicians that uh, just clouded the, the thing with terminology. It wasn't necessary. If they'd just done this, uh, they could have taken a whole textbook and reduced it to a few pages. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do is reduce the information. But um, we're also trying to make it available uh, so that you can, you, you know, use it and uh, do all sorts of things. Um, depending on how fast the internet is at a given moment, uh, uh, that will, and, and of course I suppose your computer, you have a high speed computer. Dr. 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 Just a quick yeah. question, uh, before we proceed further, like, you can always calculate, uh, given a matrix, a mini matrix, you can always any calculate matrix. the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, the eigenvectors. Mm -hmm. But it's, so is there, but then not all the eigenvectors should form a complete set, right? That there's no rule that all the eigen vectors of a matrix will form a complete set, right? Or uh, is there any property that the matrix should satisfy to form, for its eigen kits to form a complete yes, set? Yes, there is. And that is the, the, the main um, thing that it has to satisfy is that the um, minimal equation, that's the equation that the matrix satisfies, uh, it's called the hamilton cayley equation. It's basically what you get if you take the secular equation, replace the uh, unknown eigenvalue lambda in the secular equation by the matrix. Okay, so that's a matrix equation uh, that um, then we might as well use this picture right here to answer your question by going backwards. Um, here, and it is a little slow this morning, but um, the basic idea is that uh, you start with uh, a secular equation which turns into the hamilton cayley matrix equation. That's what's going on right here. So uh, if the hamilton cayley equation uh, doesn't have, when it's reduced to its minimal size, that is, if you have any repeated roots, you might be in trouble, uh, but you're not in trouble if the hamilton cayley equation can be reduced so that only have one of each of the eigenvalues. However many times they are repeated in the secular equation, you only need, if you only need one factor for that, each of those eigenvalues, not two. If you have two, you're, you're in trouble. You've got a nilpotent uh, um, um, algebraic operator, which is a, uh, a, for this stuff, a disease. <laughs> okay, that's the end of the road. You will not be able to diagonalize uh, completely that matrix. Now you can lop off some of its dimensions and then get back to work. That's what you do in Green's, Green's function theory, okay? So th that's, uh, you know, something that's always available. But this is a, a statement of whether it will satisfy completeness. Because once that happens, then yes, they are complete for that space. Uh -huh. Absolutely. No question about it. And that's summed up by the fact that the projectors add up to one. Uh, oh, okay. So if you can reduce this form, basically you have diagonalized your matrix, where each mm -hmm. of the roots mm -hmm. is what the diagonal element of your matrix. Okay. Yeah. Now, if it's got those repeated factors, then you, you there's a whole industry uh, the mathematicians uh, have uh, to quasi-diagonalize it. There's a Smith normal form, a Weierstrass normal form, a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, to quasi-diagonalize. Mm -hmm. Group theory takes care of that. So as far as I remember when I do group theory, so when you have a degenerate uh, degeneracy of eigenvalues of a matrix, you cannot uh, write it in terms of its uh, spectral decomposed parts, right? You cannot, right? No. Um, Even what if you it's just said is, is not right. If the minimal equation has uh -huh. a repeated root, Oh. Okay, that will not be entirely diagnosed. Doesn't necessarily have to have degeneracy and need side values for it degeneracy to be is loved by uh, projection theory. No problem with degeneracy of eigenvalues as long as it doesn't occur in the matrix minimal equation. As long as it doesn't happen there. 
So if you take the secular equation and it has 10 repeated roots here and 5 repeated roots here, you throw away 9 and 4 from that collection, see if the, what the matrix equation goes to 0 or not. If it goes to 0, you're in. Just go to work and use this uh, stuff that's right here. And that's true for all normal matrices. Normal matrices means that it commutes with its uh, Hermitian conjugate. If it, if it does that, that's a subclass of, co of diagonalizable matrices. This one, this 1, 2, 3, 4 doesn't satisfy that, but it still works. And that's a point that I think I see missed in a lot of quantum mechanics books. The, the normal form demand is, 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 is um, sufficient but not necessary. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4 still works. Okay, these are, these are, this is really a basic stuff, but I want, I want to make sure that we cover that um, before we get going too far here. Now, the very first thing that uh, we'll uh, work with today is just look again at the two-state system and see the uh, projection operators and the, um, the uh, uh, spectral decomposition being done more or less automatically. This is a really simple uh, matrix that we've got here uh, in which uh, these two uh, diagonal coefficients, that is the spring constants on either side are equal so it has reflection symmetry. That's a, re a whole mirror imagined uh, theory it, 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 uh, because these two are equal. Uh, it doesn't matter what this is. Uh, it's going to be uh, the same looking system after you've done a reflection. And that's the reflection. The reflection is simply switch the two coordinates. So what's cool about this and what's going to be true for all of the matrices that we do essentially from now on, not just in this lecture but the whole course, uh, we're going to be able to write the uh, matrix that describes the dynamics, in this case classical dynamics, a K-spring matrix, but uh, later on it's the H matrix, the Hamiltonian, uh, that we'll be uh, writing. Uh, uh, as long as it can be written as a linear combination of group operators, and that's going to be true for all the ones that we uh, work with, uh, then uh, here is the matrix, here is an element that we want to diagonalize, this one already is diagonalized, and so the spectral decomposition of the group operator is amounts to the spectral decomposition of the dynamic matrix, be it the K matrix or a Hamiltonian. Now, where do these matrices come from? They come from the product table of the algebra group in question. So that, that's uh, something that, um, you know, it looks like it's almost a trick at the, for a simple thing like this, but it's, it's true for all the ones we'll do today, very obviously, and also true for other things that are more complicated that come up later. But in any case, um, this little click right down here uh, gives me the last page of the spectral uh, solution to a 2D oscillator. Okay. If I click on that, I'll get the last page. But let's just go ahead and run through it real quickly. What I'm going to do on this screen is just real quickly go through from the first page. Okay. So just remember that all of the quantum mechanic problems we do have classical analogs, classical analogs of, of, a, of, a, of a, a system, in this case two-dimensional system, two masses, uh, running around in a potential uh, that's a harmonic oscillator potential with different frequencies uh, in one direction than the other. Very slow frequency on this side, a very fast frequency on that. Those, of course, are the eigenfrequency uh, of this uh, Hamiltonian, uh, I should say this K-matrix, a uh, uh, dynamical equation, a Newton's equation of motion is basically what this is. Acceleration is equal to a constant times the position. Uh, good old Hooke's Law, but in two dimensions. So this is just a picture of a little bowl, I call it the Bear Valley uh, uh, ski resort, that has an advanced slope here and a beginner slope there. Those are our eigendirections. We've got to find those uh, using symmetry analysis. So th that's what we're uh, talking about here. 
and that's what we uh, start okay. with. Once again, could you once again uh, briefly uh, explain what are those fast and slow axes? This thing right here, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or this one right here. Yeah, both both the axes, the fast yeah. and slow. This both is this red axis right here is slow. You can see that the distance between the topography lines. Right. This is a gentle slope right, right. in the uh, northeasterly direction, and then this perpendicular one right here, they're closer together, right? Right. So this this is fast. That's slow, right there. Okay. So is it related to the phase space plots? Well, the phase space plots involve position and momentum, momentum or velocity, right? And we'll have phasers for each one of these. You run those phasers, and that runs the whole system. That's basically what. Uh, you do when you do a spectral decomposition. So you pick the extremes, right, and they serve as your eigen, your characteristic, uh, that's what eigen means, my own, your, your characteristic direction. So things that really characterize uh, either the Hamiltonian or this K matrix. Does that answer what you're yeah, 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 so. after? Okay, now, um, when one of the things, when, you, when you're using this on your computer and looking through, uh, these things right here, this is where it takes it step by step, okay? There's the group table. The group table uh, basically is 1-1 one, one because there's sigma uh, on the, uh, where that 1 is in the group table and then the unit operator, very, very simple uh, thing that happens here. You wouldn't even make notice of it if you didn't know it's going to work later on for big things. But anyway, these are Dirac notations for those, those things and uh, this is where we uh, use this uh, to make our, well, our basis. Our basis is just uh, one uh, set here where the, sec the second one is where this guy's moved by one unit and the, the first one is where the first one is moved by one unit. And then we're going to be finding things where they move together. So th this is where it, uh, uh, the idea of doing these uh, two oscillators uh, gives you a spectral decomposition. This is a spectral decomposition of the two operators we're interested in. In terms of projection operators, in this case they're really simple. Half sum and half difference are the two projection matrices uh, that describe the symmetric mode and the anti-symmetric mode that we made a big fuss about um, for those waves. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, in the last lecture. Okay, so is this making making sense? I, I want to make connection between the, the simplest possible group theory and the simplest possible dynamical system. Yeah. Can you update that? A uh, what? Like the image in this uh, projector. That means we got to go over on the other screen. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, and here's the other thing you have to be able to do on your computer you have to be able to get back to the original lecture, okay? Like that, okay? And then go ahead and, you know, look at anything you want to look at, and I'll just I'll go right here to the uh, punchline. There's the punchline that we're looking at right now. Um, <clears throat> and there is the, uh, another punchline that has a whole bunch of stuff. And again, the first page of this is worth looking at if you're a little confused about what's going on. But here I am taking that projection matrix that's a symmetric one. It's all ones divided by two, and this one is all ones divided by two, except I have a minus on the diagonal, right? I'm factoring those into half. I'm just basically cutting them in half, 50-50. I could put some gauge factors on it. I'm not going to do that, okay? So I'm going to have the plus plus uh, ket bra, and I'm going to have the minus minus ket bra. Uh, those are the two direct notations for a projection operator, the symmetric and anti-symmetric. And then I'm going to take those components, the ones from the ket, and make a matrix that will diagonalize the original uh, guy up here, the K matrix. And then from the broad uh, sets, uh, the, that, that's... Uh, shown with these lines right here. These are the bra sets over here. These are the ket sets that come from the guys that are standing up. So you think of a ket that points this way, okay? The flat side is the side that can take an operator. Uh, the pointed side, uh, every time an operator hits it, it goes away. So the 
can't, nothing can happen there. The bras that are this way, the flat side takes the operator from this side. So it's the bras that are uh, sitting here waiting uh, to be multiplied. And then the kits are here waiting to multiply this way. This is called a diagonalizing transformation, something you have to do. Uh, in every atomic, molecular, and optical system that I know of, okay, in order to get a matrix that is diagonal. Okay, so that, that's what all this is about right here. And then this right here is just a summing up of what the modes look like in a table that's called the character table uh, for group theory. But we do them one better. Instead of just putting the numbers down, one and one, that's basically these uh, numbers right here, and one and minus one, okay, those are the numbers that go with this projector, one and minus one, first column, okay. Putting those down, those are the two eigenvectors uh, uh, of this system. Now, it works the other way, too, really. Uh, what I do is I put down the bras in order to conform to the standard uh, way uh, that all of the literature does character tables, but they, they're just doing it sort of blindly. This is a, something that really associates the uh, rows of this matrix with the position points, P for point, the zero point and the one point. This is the zero point, there's the one point, okay? Um, we, we name the modes in the same way. This is the mode number, zero and one. Mode or momentum, okay? Uh, this is the M side of the thing. So what we're working with today is a, a, a transformation matrix that shows the modes, that is their actual phasor complex values, and they will be complex shortly here, uh, that, that uh, uh, de define all of the uh, eigenvectors of all the things that have trigonal C3 symmetry or C2 symmetry or finally C6 today. That's what we're going to study. Okay? So is this making some sense? This is where uh, it is. And again, if you want to go to the first page of any of these discussions, it's easy to find by just going back to the uh, table of contents that's closest to this. Uh, particular page. Dr. Hatta? Yeah. This is the, the symmetry analysis of a classical two-dimensional oscillator. Who has this K matrix. Yeah. That's what this is. But that is directly analogous to a Hamiltonian matrix. And we're going to make a big fuss about that later. A Hamiltonian matrix. The only difference is the Hamiltonian matrix is the square root of this thing. So the eigenvalues of this thing give you frequency squared, which is, you know, energy for classical people, right? So that's just using Sylvester formula, right? Just but, the, uh, Sylvester's name is attached to uh, spectral decompositions or um, formulas that uh, look like uh, the, this. If you, if you cut through some of the fog that goes with Sylvester's formula usually. So yeah. one thing I remember when one word you gave us was, was like, so if, you, if I take like the square root of that Hamiltonian, it's just like if I were taking the square root of the eigenvalues of the spectral decomposed right. terms, right? And that's, that's what we call a functional spectral decomposition. And maybe we should turn the uh, camera to, uh, uh, we're at the second uh, slide of the a wall over here where I have the matrix written as a sum of projectors with eigenvalues. That's the spectral decomposition. The projectors themselves add up to one. And the most important equation is the very top one there where the projection operators are eigen operators of the original matrix, which then gives the formula at the very top. And I do believe that Sylvester's name is attached to that formula at the top. It's just that I've never seen it, uh, you know, so stated. Uh, in any case, this uh, guy right down here is what you're talking That's what I about. American matrix. You were talking about, say, taking the square root of yeah. the matrix. Uh -huh. 
So well, that's just the find a, on pi just find the square root of the eigenvalues. So th this is the way you can take an exponential of a, of a matrix, which we really need, right? We're going to need that for Lie algebras, yeah, Lie groups, right? That's one way to do it. We get better ways, much better ways to do that than uh, thing. But when you're really stuck, that's what you would use. And you can program a computer to do that fairly quickly for big matrices. Okay, is there anything else about the simple stuff so we can go on um, to the uh, somewhat more complicated stuff? Okay, um, what I'll do is uh, take us uh, to um, a little bit of the dynamics that comes uh, with um, and so I'm going to uh, go ahead and just look at um, this uh, particular uh, page uh, that's uh, in there, and I hope it comes up fairly quickly here. It may be that. Well, yeah, Dr. Hunter, just to. So you said that uh, the Hamiltonian will turn out to be the square root of this diagonalized k matrix, right? So in which case, if you just take the square root of the K matrix, mm -hmm. you end up getting the Hamiltonian. energy eigenvalues of the equivalent the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah. Can, can you repeat that again? Um, what we'll show later, and it's not very difficult to show this, although I, I make it a little difficult in the beginning, but that's because I want to make a clean connection between the canonical classical mechanics and Power mechanics, but basically, if you just take the square root of the equation, double derivative of time, to double time derivative of vector, okay, equals k matrix times vector with a minus sign, right? And take the square root of that, then you get a single derivative. And you get an i for the square root of the minus, and then the square root of that matrix, k, becomes the h matrix. And the i comes over on this side, so you get i times partial with respect to time of the vector of interest is equal to h times the vector of interest. That's Schrodinger's equation that works for everything all the way through a uh, uh, relativity. Presumably, someday it'll work for quantum gravity. Did you just see that using a group theory, right? Like, you just derived it using. Yeah, the group group is just happy to work on either one of those things, and then transform them into each other, right? Whatever symmetry group the thing has, okay. right? Yeah. So, so is, is a textbook reference for this particular problem uh, the chapter on harmonic oscillators on uh, quantum theory for computer age? Is that the uh, resource for? Uh, Let me see if I'm uh, following you there. Um, maybe I should go back. Uh, to the original um, guy here, um, so that I can go back and forth between the slides. This is uh, where we're at right now, okay? And we're about to look at some dynamics, but um, this is sort of the sum, and I'm going to do the same thing uh, with that one just for now, because it's so slow. Uh, it seems to be molasses this morning uh, here. Uh, let's see if we can go ahead here. This is the dynamics that we're going to be looking at, uh, but the uh, this part of this thing is, is what we're um, arguing about now. This is this is telling all I can tell you about a two-state classical uh, operator. Okay, as I say, um, the equation of motion for that thing square rooted is is a Schrodinger equation, so we're, we're solving that too. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and just real quickly look at the dynamics because it's just like the dynamics uh, that we um, we uh, saw on those two waves that uh, we looked at uh, yesterday. So I'm going to uh, go ahead put that on both screens for the time being. The basic idea is that you start out with a system that's all coupled up with off-diagonal elements and you turn it into an equation of motion for something that has only diagonal elements, you've found the eigenvectors, you've found the normal modes, if it's a classical system, right? You've found the quantum normal modes, that's what they should call the, um, 
the eigenvectors of a, of a Schrodinger equation, right? Quantum normal modes, right? Those normal modes that have a heartbeat, but the uh, outside of the wave doesn't move. They're called stationary states, right? They're not really stationary. Inside there's that heart, right? And that heart is really fast. What, some, what everybody's done in quantum mechanics is left out the mc squared over h bar. MC squared over H bar is huge for any M at all, even an electron, right? MC squared, C squared, C, 3 times 10 to the 8th. Now it's 9 times 10 to the 16th. And then the denominator, you got H bar, 10 to the minus 34 in the denominator. Now it comes up on the numerator, you got 34 times that. That's how fast the heartbeat is of a single electron. Imagine what it is for you. You've got a lot of electrons in you, right? It's astronomical, astronomical rate. That's what's going on inside a stationary state. Now we mix it with another stationary state and they do a gentle beating. This is the difference between their frequencies. But they're huge frequencies. Huge, right? To your friend always says, huge. This is really huge. What if all the electrons on your body will be in resonance? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you, when you realize the speed of things that are going on, it's just mind-boggling, right? Yeah. Fortunately, we get to ignore most of it, right? Every once in a while, it pops out, right? That, that, that energy is available. And various things like atomic bombs and nuclear, thermonuclear bombs. Yeah, we, we got to worry about that sometimes. But here is where we actually mix those uh, guys together, okay? I, I, I make a combination state out of this. I'm, I'm, I start with something that just has uh, the um, particle uh, on one particular axis, I think over here, and let it go. And that's what these uh, sim uh, simulations uh, do. And I, I go ahead and use the one that's um, uh, on this particular machine, because it um, you complained about the brightness of this screen. We haven't had a chance to fix that yet, but we can still uh, go ahead and run uh, this thing where we start the thing here and what you're getting is these two normal modes, one of them a, a little bit faster than the other. This one is just a little bit slower than that one. So we get a very slow beat uh, between these two. And this isn't too different from what's going on uh, in that uh, sneaky tunneling uh, that's on the far screen. Uh, that if I were to plot it in time, I would be getting these beats. First, this one gets big and that one gets small. And then this one gets big while that one's small. So this is a, a, a beautiful example of transfer of energy. And what you notice uh, with these uh, things, if you slow them down, and you can do that uh, just by uh, reducing uh, a number here. I can take this down to, I can even make it go backwards. But there's where you can see uh, that the uh, that the, the uh, phaser of this one right here, and let, let's see if I've got it. yes, the phaser for this one uh, is uh, 90 degrees behind the fed, and then this one comes out the back door now, uh, becoming a, a leader. Uh, let's see if that it just happens so fast it's hard to track. Yeah, you, you, you don't see that uh, switcheroo there, but um, the, there. <laughs> the basic idea is that you have a 90 degree angle between uh, both of these, and that 90 degree angle uh, shows up when you go ahead and factor this thing in a beautiful, nice beautiful way to, to make these sums into just uh, functions that are cosine and sine. But sine with an i, you see, is what you get for this one right here. This is the difference between the positive x, one exponential, and then this sine reversed one. This is a sum. That gives you a cosine. This one is a sine. It gives you an i times a sine. So note the i phase. That's the phase that you're seeing of 90 degrees between these two right here. Okay. And any time you want to, you can just reset time equals zero and see that. Okay, so that one started with everything. Now it comes back and um, 
mm -hmm. starts to grow uh, the uh, other oscillator. It's pumping up the particle in the other well, okay, ever so slowly and so evenly. And so, I mean, it's really a beautiful dance, okay, uh, that you see there. And this thing is uh, 90 degrees ahead of that. Now it isn't anymore. It's going to go out the back door. And now this one will be 90 degrees ahead of that one. You see. So this, this stuff multiplied by thousands and all sorts of other complications is what we'll be talking about in atomic and molecular optical physics for as long as we stay in the field. The fundamental way nature does its business, which is a wave business. Okay, I think we can, um, and by the way, when you uh, play with these things on your computer, it's always a good idea uh, before you leave a movie to pause it so you won't be using up CPU. If you leave a whole bunch of movies running, your computer gets slower and slower because it's running all those movies, right? So it's a good idea to shut them down before you uh, uh, move on. Okay, so I'm coming back to the original uh, lecture here. I'm going to do the same thing that's already on the original lecture. I just want to point out that two-state systems are so much a part of our physics that it's worthwhile paying attention to that briefly. Okay, and we're going to take this up the general two-state system, not just a symmetric C2 two-state system, uh, in parts of the next lecture. But uh, for this one, I just want to point out that probably the most famous, and maybe uh, not the earliest, but certainly the one that you'll get right away in almost any um, a modern physics course, is the Robbie Ramsey Schwinger spin uh, resonance. In this case, they are thinking of proton resonance. Uh, and we're in the process of inventing the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance machine, which got renamed as a MRI, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Okay, it's all based on, on water molecules having hydrogens that uh, have enough of a moment to really show up, enough to give you a signal. Okay, so this is re re really important, but this is the first one. This is 1862. This is electromagnetic polarization of a, of a wave in a vacuum or in a solid, you're going to have X and Y polarization. And there'll be a phasor associated with each one of those. Okay. Now this is a reference that we should put some lines under because uh, it makes, makes connection to stuff we're going to be doing uh, next time. But here, after Robbie Ramsey and Schwinger wrote their paper, Feynman, you know, so he's, he's not always first for these things, but he's always uh, pretty good at seeing the whole picture. Feynman, a student of Hellworth and, and Robert Hellworth, in 1957 wrote a paper in J. Applied Physics, uh, which points out that the ammonia molecule in version states, and this was just after Towns had uh, discovered the maser. So the maser is based on ammonia, a molecule that, that can tunnel it's uh, nitrogen through the H3 triangle. And about like uh, what we're seeing on the screen over there. So this is a real two-level two tunneling problem that um, is worth mentioning. So here they are, the three most famous two-state systems. Okay, enough of two-state systems. Three, two's company, three's a crowd, right? That's human interactions, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to do a crowd now, okay? Uh, <laughs> three. What do you do with three? Okay. <laughs> so we need some work on that. That's uh, very much a part of this. So first thing um, I'll do is just show you the whole page. But this is one where if you go to the first page, we take this on slowly. All right. Uh, look at it. Um, this and I usually put a first page reference. Let's see if it will work this time. Not so bad. Okay, so this is that uh, uh, lecture uh, eleven, and we're looking at page six. 
uh, at this moment, and the very next thing is uh, the group table for C3. Okay, so that's the first thing you would normally do for small groups is get a multiplication table uh, written down and write it down in a very special way. The, the, the idea is to put the unit element on the diagonal. So you, you, you line up your, um, your uh, um, operators, r to the zeroth power, r to the first power, r to the second power, and then you line them up by flipping their, put their inverses there. Well, that's the same for the unit, but then you flip these two right here. So you have r to the second power and r to the first power uh, in the first and second positions respectively. That results in the inverses always meeting on the diagonal, right? And then you get some other elements depending on uh, how uh, those products come out. So that's the the first thing, everything's going to be based on uh, the group table. The group table is going to provide us all projectors and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that th is the very first thing. And that's why it's a good idea, you see, to have the ability uh, to not just look at this whole thing at once, right? I mean, if you're going to make uh, education better, you want to have just a focus on some important points first, right? And I'm, what I'm doing, I'm trying to establish, because you guys are going to be writing this kind of stuff yourselves, right? And the question is how to do that so that you get the ideas across mo most quickly, right? That's a whole subject in its own. And we've got this technology now, not always working perfectly, but at least it's usable now. Finally, I've been doing this since 1986, and it's been a fight every minute of it, but the uh, idea is Put this, put the thing down. So here's the deal: is the Hamiltonian. I'm now thinking of an H matrix, but it could be a K matrix. I'm writing down coefficients of all three of the group operators. So I'm putting an R1 coefficient uh, where there's an R1. R1 means the coefficient of R to the first power. And then R2 is the coefficient of R to the second power. Okay. And then each one of these things is the actual operator in matrix form. It's called the regular representation because it does a regular permutation. Uh, details we'll worry about later on. But uh, there you go with a bunch of matrices made out of ones and zeros. And those are the operators. R to zeroth power, R to the first power, R to the second power. So this is the way we take this group apart. Is, is write it down as powers of a single operator. That's that's a cyclic group. That's what it is. It's a cyclic group of order three, C3. Okay. And the coupling constants, the coupling constants are actual couplings between uh, these two objects. This guy is felt, feels the effect of this guy through a coefficient R1. But this guy feels the effect of this one through a coefficient R2. Hmm. There might be a battle there. And there will be. That's a gauge battle. We'll be working with the cases where R2 is equal to R1. So that's what you get if you just have a plain old classical spring describing this. And this is a K matrix as opposed to a, an H matrix. But in general, those coefficients could be, some of them anyway, complex. And that is uh, worth making uh, a point now before we run into it later and be surprised by it. So the, these coupling constants for these particular operators are the physics. That's the, the physics is hiding in that. Okay. And the next step on this thing is to point out that the uh, if the, the, the grayed out may change values if somebody ruins the symmetry. Somehow the symmetry is, is ruined, and it will be ruined if you change those values. So it's an if and only if uh, situation. And then, uh, if they are complex, then those particular ones, R1 and R2, have to be complex conjugates of each other. But no matter what, the R0 has to be real in order for this to be a Hermitian matrix. And that's part of the quantum mechanics, but it's also of interest in the classical as well. So I hope that makes some sense. And then here are the base states. There are three of them now, not two. Okay. First base state. 
zero space state. That's a better way to count. Physicists count from zero if they're not physical. If you're doing the thunder uh, clap, there's lightning and you go zero and then one, two, three, four, five. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, that's, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, five seconds is a mile. That's something that was a mile away. Okay? So you count zero right, right off the bat and then go one to man and two to man. Okay, that, that's what we're doing here. Zero based. And if you're com a computer jock, you know that in C, everything's zero based. The numbers are uh, zero based, just like this. Okay? So the points that we uh, point out here, three points, uh, will be zero, one, and two. Modulo three, and that's the whole thing we have to do here, uh, is um, talk about the uh, modularity. Now this is a, 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 a site for sore eyes to, to see it. Again, it was worthwhile doing the first page of that one. Okay, so I'm going to back off here, go back here, uh, go forward to this uh, page, and it's worthwhile on this one definitely going uh, for the first page. And it looks like I forgot to put a first page uh, 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 clicker on this this one. There's uh, one in the middle. Will you excuse me if we just look at this one? <laughs> um, the, it's right the, above your phasers. Is it above the phasers? Above that cyan Oh my gosh, position. right here. Yeah. There it is. Let's do it because this is, this is a mess and we really would like to do a, a, a logical job of this thing. So here is uh, the idea that if we can resolve the uh, operator R and H is a combination of R, we'll have resolved the Hamiltonian H. That's the basic idea, okay? But the R resolution involves looking at a cube root. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the cube root of what? Okay? E to the I, um, if you have a, a complex number Z and say it's 1, uh, you would be taking the cube root of that and you get E to the 2 pi I M over 3. So the cube root of Z uh, is that. Well, that's, there's three values of M uh, that, that satisfy that equation and those are the three values we'll be working with. Those will be the irreducible representations of this symmetry. So what we have here is the fact that these, all of these operators satisfy this minimal equation, this hamilton cayley equation, this minimal equation. No repeated roots, so they're not in trouble there. But we very quickly factor the thing into three factors. Then, the first projection operator is the product of those two with some scale factor. The second projection operator is the product of those two. And the third projection operator is the product of those two. That's the uh, Sylvester, or whatever you want to call it, a formula uh, for projectors. Okay, so we're, we're going to take those and make uh, something that is the eigen operator of each of, of, each of the R's, all, all of the R's. R0, R1, R2, and R3 equal R1. Okay, so there's the orthocompleteness relation there. There's a spectral decomposition relation right there in terms of three projectors that we haven't worked out yet. And there is the uh, functional spectral decomposition. The square of the middle one is there. So I'm going to be taking these, and this is a standard notation, chi for character. That's the name that's given to eigenvalues of group operators, roughly speaking. And the uh, uh, eigenvalues of zero, one and two is there to the zeroth power to the first power and to the second power for each of the possible characters uh, that you can have of, that are cube roots of one. Okay? So that, that's the basic idea. That's the thing that gets this started. Then you go ahead and make a picture of it so you can see what it looks like. There are the three characters. Actually, those are the complex conjugates of the three characters. Uh, minor detail. And let me get the thing out of the way there uh, so that you can see that, you know, exactly what we're talking about here. So that's you know, leading to this uh, stuff uh, right here. Okay? So we make a table. 
And that's the character table for C3 right there. And once again, we have something labeled by point or position on top, so that's space, and something that's labeled with M, that will be a K vector or momentum or mode number, that's the other uh, uh, mnemonic that goes with the letter M, so you, what you have here is per space versus space table. That's the physicist way, it should be the physicist way, to look at a character table. Okay? Well, we'll make more fuss about that sort of stuff uh, later on. But anyway, there are the numbers all lined up in a way which you would find if you looked in a textbook uh, on group theory and, uh, and uh, <coughs> Google the character table from their index. And uh, there, that's, the, uh, that's what we're uh, getting. Uh, here, so that's pretty much it. But at this point, you can draw the pictures of the waves, right? I mean, let's just draw the complex numbers that go with those complex numbers, and then draw a wave through it. And it's of course only valid at that point, and that point, and that point. There are only three points. It's discrete, but. This trick works for all uh, acyclic groups. Eventually, we'll, you'll see that we have a lot of, uh, of, of um, complicated looking things, but they're very simple. They're, they're just this uh, thing. So, this is a formula for chi star. That will be the uh, actual wave function. This is another way to write it. Okay. All right. Now, I don't know if this is a good time to do it, but we might as well try the, this out here. I, I'm hoping this will uh, give us an um, a actual picture of a motion of the, of the wave. There we go. That's the beautiful C3 wave that has non-zero momentum. There's only two of them, the one going this way, and there's another one going the other way, and that's it. The other wave is just flat completely flat. And in this particular Hamiltonian, zero frequency, but you can make it any frequency uh, you want. You can scale all of them up and it's, it's you know, still kosher. Okay? So, uh, let's, um, as I follow what I teach, and that is, I'll pause this. Now, be aware, this, well, we have this application here. If you want to play with these things, uh, you can make any wave you want. Zero it all and look at the zero wave. Okay? There it is. As I turn the, uh, the master phaser down here, that wave goes up and down. The real part and the imaginary part are actually shown there by a dark line and a light blue line that is ahead of it. Imagination ahead of pre reality. Remember that, uh, Lewis? Yeah. Uh, the same thing happening here if I keep it on a circle. Okay? All right? Now I zero that guy. <clears throat> I forget how, how you zero. Uh, that ox. Uh, I, here you can use it. I just wonder if you zero one of them. Okay, here is the one we just looked at. Okay, and as it moves, the, the wave moves, right? And I'm going clockwise. All the phasers have to go clockwise for positive energy. Okay? Now you, you might ask, uh, what do I get if I got, put two waves in there? I get the same damn wave, it's just, uh, you know, it's the same for each one of these guys, it's just different uh, for the others. What happens if I uh, put this one in there? Okay. Well, it's, for the phasers it's the same, but it's got, all, uh, it's got more kinks in between, right? And that's the same thing that's true uh, on this side. If I go down here and do this one, they just, it just goes a different way when I go clockwise. So this is a nice lesson here. This is Fourier control right here. Okay, I can make a, a negative a wave. There's the wave with one kink going so uh, the on this going side. this way now when I crank this clockwise, and I can put them together. Okay, I can put this guy together with this one and make a standing wave. Okay, and you'll see that if we launch it. 
This wave goes this way, this wave goes this way, makes a standing wave. These, these are points that I'll make uh, later on. So when you start adding the two rows of the character table, you get this, or you can uh, add uh, you can add them with different phases uh, to get something else. We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. All right, I think we've um, probably done uh, enough uh, to um, allow us to go ahead on this um, thing. We've been uh, working at about an hour here. This whole business of orthonormality and completeness is uh, being shown uh, in the character table. Uh, is, is there. Now, some secretarial work is in, no, in notion. How do I make connection between the group theoretical way of looking at these things and the wave function wave? We're used to e to the i k x, right? We're, we're, we've got something more abstract here. We've got e to the i m p times 2 pi over 3. Okay. Well, this is where you you use the ordinary Cartesian coordinate xp to be some lattice constant times an integer p. p for point, right? p equals 0, p equals 1, p equals 2. Dr. Carter, uh, when you normalize a plane wave function, we always end up getting root square root of 2 pi in the denominator, right? When, when we uh, normalize plane wave function. You're thinking when you do a normalization, you have an integral and you bring down the... Yeah, the root 2 pi because... Yeah. We get that from delta function because uh, that's right. So um, we don't have that one this, here. This one. The group. The, what's so great about group theory is it does automatic normalization if you know how to do it. And the reason for that is that once you've got the projection operators, they have to add up to one. So you end up with fractions, not square roots of fractions. Mm -hmm. And you end up with all the fractions on the projector and nothing on the, uh, the, the conjugate. That's very convenient. You don't have to write uh, 1 over the square root of 3 on both of them. So you put the 1 third down on one of them that you don't really use that much, and then the, uh, the corrective thing is automatic for the wave function that comes. So I guess that's a quick yeah. and blib answer to what you're asking, but I want to, I, I, I so when we come back to another expansion, so I think we'll show that. These, uh, this, uh, you know, from the character table, so those coefficients have more probabilistic interpretation because I know if I just like multiply them all of, the, if I multiply you gotta all of them. got to square them to make probabilities, yes, right? Yes, and then I sum them, they all sum to one. So if I have like mm -hmm. a, like a fourfold symmetry, yes. I will just put a square root of four, right? That would be true for all the waves. Yeah, because I would have like the same Any value of getting the same all yeah. irreducible representation of the projectors, right? Let me let me sorry uh, projection wave down here for a minute here uh, and bring this guy a, back. A, a pi term in the denominator. That's fine. You're integrating. Yeah, that's fine. That's we're easy. summing. This yeah. is a discrete space versus your continuous space. Yeah, yeah. Here, here are the functions like uh, the, the square of this plus the square points. of that plus the square of that, that adds up to three. Right? Oh, three. So you have, you're going to uh, normalize that. Function of X One third. Position. Yeah. The coefficient of, of the projector. Because the projector is the thing that has to square the to a projector. The value on right? those points can be It's item potent. That means you multiply the, the P's together and get P. Yeah. It's so much easier to work with that kind of normalization than one that involves square roots. Okay. That now, you know, when I took the group theory class, I, I had like this in more immature idea that I have now. Now I see like more, more like to interpret this physically. And also the uh, more, yeah. also yeah. the um, more. this sort of, of weird arithmetic that comes up here. First of all, make sure that you, you, you use this so that you can communicate with other papers that use x instead of just a point. Okay. And the wavelength, the same thing, right? Wavelength comes out uh, to be uh, three times the length because there's three different la lattice spacings, right? Divided by the mode number, right? Okay, so that will work for any of the mode numbers that are not zero, right? That's giving you the, uh, the wavelength, uh, 2 pi over km. 
And then, this is, this is something else we've got to get used to. Here are the position cats. The uh, operator, the symmetry operator, does what to the cue? Well, this is a, uh, a, a point in space. These are P for point in space, but then there's a cue that's also a point in space here. So if this, was, th this thing this comes along, it gives you this. That's what you mean by translating uh, by P points, okay? That, that's just one, then I do one jump. This is two, I do two jumps, you see. Okay, now, if this is true, then Dirac conjugation gives you this, inverse operator on the, uh, operating on Q pointing the other way, a bra Q. Okay, that's the uh, transpose conjugate, right? That's also Q plus P, right? Conjugation, I'm going to change this number, that's just a, that, that, that's stuck with that state, right? So that implies that when I apply RP on a bra, I move it backwards. Okay? Now when you put those two together, you see, when you do an RP right here on the Q, you subtract the P right here. But that's just what you meant to do. You meant to move this wave function that way, and the way you move that wave function that way is subtract the thing you're moving it by, P. So this is, you know, it sounds like, uh, you know, you, what, what were we talking about, something so simple, but this is really the whole idea of forwards and backwards, duality between bras and kets. Okay. So basically, RP is a translation operator that operates on, on, on the, yeah. In this case, on a bra. Yeah. And you can see what it is. It has to have a minus sign. If you want to go this way, you've got to put a minus sign here. Okay? So these are arguments you have to go through every time you use symmetry. You have to make sure that you know uh, what your uh, wave function is doing with respect to the algebra. You have to get your bra kit algebra right. And so I, I, I meant to see, the, see this point okay, uh, right away. Okay, I think we can zip, a, zip along here. There's the thing we're talking about. Uh, we've caught up to that. This is another thing that bothers people. And it really would help to have a first page here. I'm not going to do it because I want you to study this on your own. I want you to be able to count, not binary. That, that everyone knows because all computers are binary computers and you've had Boolean algebra, right? This is a trinary computer. This is not a qubit. This is a true bit or a tri bit. Okay? Nobody talks about that. The possibility of having quantum systems with tri bits or quadra or 60. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities that just are not even being thought about. And uh, I would say, uh, here we are starting already with something that's not binary, it's trinary. So things that are modulo 3, 4 modulo 3 is equal to 1. It's just the remainder of 4 divided by 3. So this, this operation of modulo is really important for everything we're going to be doing here as we start to look at the molecules rotating and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So it really starts here. We have the power of the operator, which stands for P, but it's also the position point uh, of uh, some lattice, this uh, trinary lattice. Okay? And then the modes, 0, 1, and 2, also are modulo 3. So we're going to be using modular arithmetic for both the space and the per space, both the location and the momentum number, quantum number. And finally, the tables, okay? This is where we make connection with group theory to come. Right now, there is no distinction between what we call an irreducible representation, and I write Europe, and sometimes with just single R. These are usually designated by the letter D, and I don't know where that got started, but it's everywhere. And um, right now, the Ds and the Chi's are equal. The chi's being the characters that we just made tables of. 
uh, for C3. And so that, that uh, uh, table basically uh, is showing the multiplication table of the chi's that exactly copies the group. In other words, these represent the group. These numbers represent the group. So this is a multiplication table of numbers, complex numbers, that is exactly the same structure as this. If there's any question about you know, what a representation is, it's a faithful representation. It's, uh, sometimes what mathematicians call something that uh, does that uh, 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 very well. All right, anything else? I think we're ready to move on here. Um, and I will go through this quickly because what I want to be able to do, and we've got uh, about a little less than half an hour to go here, what I'd like to be able to do is get into C6. Okay? But here's one where you really would like to have a, a first page, and maybe once again, no, here it is right here. First page just looks at this. Okay, so let's get it on the other screen, uh, Lewis. Uh, I don't want to have Lewis to have to go to eye doctor after every class, so uh, we'll uh, look at this one uh, right here, and I'll use a laser to point at it. So, so what is the textbook reference for uh, these topics at the Not the lecture style, the textbook reference. Is it the, uh, uh, the textbook reference? And let me point it out. Uh, on the screen down there. Okay. Uh, the textbook reference, um, let me give you a better reference first. Okay. The textbook is a little behind this. Okay. okay. So let me go here and point this uh, right here. Oh, okay. That paper over there. Yes. But to answer your textbook uh, question, that's, you know, where is it in this one? It's unit four, unit four okay. uh, which is, actually it's unit three, but I, it's the one that has that fancy um, rainbow of phasers, which we're going to look at in just a minute here, okay? Unit three uh, takes on C3, that's the way to remember it. but. Um, the way we're doing it is a little more streamlined what's in that textbook. And this, particularly with non-abelian groups, this particular uh, paper, the 213 paper, um, takes you through that. Plus, it, the beginning of it is daunting. The beginning of the paper goes into tensor analysis, which we'll do later. But you go a little bit and, and you come to the section where it, it takes you back to this uh, simple group theory. Of C6 is just what we're about to do here. Okay, but let me let me point out something that's happened here. When I want to find the actual expectation value of the Hamiltonian, that's the energy, the energy eigenvalue, and I've got a Hamiltonian that's written as uh, linear combinations of powers of R, and I've got the eigenvalues for those, I get this uh, formula which I then collect, because the zero is real easy, that's just R zero, okay, and then I get a cosine right here. A cosine of 2 pi m, 2 m pi over 3. Cosine of 2 pi m over 3, okay? Well, uh, that's, th that has a value of just simply 2 R for uh, m equals zero, but for m equal plus or minus uh, this, uh, this uh, value comes out to minus a half. So minus a half times two is minus one. So those are the two eigenvalues of our Hamiltonian for the choices zero plus and minus one, respectively. And then uh, how, what do you do with those eigenvalues? Well, if it's a quantum mechanical thing, you're done. You see, quantum mechanics just takes the eigenvalue of the energy operator and says, that's it, boys. That's what we're going to have to pay, a dime a kilowatt hour, whatever this is, right? But when it's classical, you still got to take a square root of this thing, okay? This needs a square root right here. So what we're looking at, actually, is a cosine for the uh, 
a Hamiltonian. So there's a cosine right here with a minus sign on it that describes all of the cyclic systems that we're going to be doing. But we only use this point here and these two points here uh, in our particular uh, solution to get these vectors frequencies. Okay? So down at the bottom we have these characters. That's the m equals zero. I've rearranged them so they match the energy. And then right here I've got plus and minus one. Plus one's a right-hand moving wave, minus is a left-hand moving wave. If we don't have any complex numbers uh, co in these coupling constants, uh, these are going to be the same frequencies. So they'll both be degenerate. And that's the basic geometry of the Eigen solutions. It's just a triangle, an equilateral triangle. But you've got to take the square root of this thing if you're going to do classical dispersion. Okay? So this is an exciton-like uh, dispersion. This is a phonon-like dispersion. It has a nice uh, a speed of sound slope here at the beginning. This one has slope zero at the k equals zero, momentum equals zero, momentum equals zero point. Okay. Uh, this one's got uh, no slope at all. This one's got a, a, a constant slope, at least nearly constant for the first few pixels there. Then it bends over. That's a phonon band, a dispersion function. Okay, works out to be a sine, the square root of k, of not two pi over three, but pi over three, because you can take a half angle uh, there if you like. Okay. Now you'll notice that this one is linear for low m, but this one is quadratic for low m. You take the cosine, it just becomes x squared. Okay, so those are some things I wanted to point out before we go on here uh, to the uh, more complicated C6 uh, group. Any questions that you can think of um, about this? Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, point out that there are these two kinds of waves, the standing wave and the uh, moving wave. Here are the standing eigenwaves, here are the moving eigenwaves. Okay. This is a cosine-like standing wave. This is a sine-like standing wave. This is the uh, exponential plus and exponential minus added. Here they're subtracted. And then the eigenfrequencies uh, for either one of these uh, is the same. But this one down here has uh, got two times that with no cosine. And then there's the k uh, frequencies if you're doing classical uh, dispersion. Uh, basically a Hooke-Newton equation. Is, uh, those are the uh, dispersion functions. And the same thing is true about making standing waves and uh, moving waves uh, out of those. Okay, is this pretty, pretty clear? Um, uh, this is a, uh, another picture of the same thing. Can you go back one slide? Say again? Can you go back one slide? I want to ask you something. Okay. This one? Uh -huh. Yeah, so in that part of the moving eigen wave, so you have a column vector times a ket, or, or, or am I missing something like between yeah. like the column vector and the ket? Yeah, is there, this, is there this one, um, this one, uh, I'll go ahead and run it on this screen if I can. Uh, this one right here, uh -huh. that's it. What about the get, get S3 uh, after the column vector? Oh, this guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's make that. Um, first of all, be aware um, that um, this one belongs to, and let's go to Fourier control here, this one belongs to, to the M equal 1, mode number 1. Okay. Kill it. Now, the one that's not shown up there, but th at the very bottom, this mode right here, okay, you know what that looks like. Let's go ahead and run it. 
Um, I'll just launch it. Here we go. Uh, nothing. Doesn't do anything because it has zero frequency. Okay. But um, if I give it some, you know, initial value, it'll just sit there because the frequency for it is zero. We, we don't uh, have, uh, I mean, you can obviously add uh, an outside uh, thing to each of them to keep the symmetry, and then this would move, but uh, right now it's just set to zero. Now, the ones you're asking about is obtained by taking a difference between the one and the minus one, right? So I start this one up like this, okay? And then instead of making a cosine wave, which is what this would make, all right? This is a cosine wave. Here's zero, cosine, right? Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to take it down here, and if I make it exactly equal, which is, that's pretty close right there, right? Well, not too bad. I should also make the clock right. Okay, that's about the best I can do with my quivery hands. You can see very clearly a, a sine wave, right? But it's a standing wave. You can't tell me this is moving this way or that way because I have equal amounts of something going this way and something going that way. So the momentum is quenched. That's the name that they give, making a standing wave out of something that had some current going. You quench the current make them interfere themselves to zero. Okay, does that answer your question about the, the sine wave, which is what this one is? Yeah, but you are saying that the standing wave equals the moving wave. It's made of sum of moving waves. Okay. Right? And so is the cosine, right? Yeah. The better way to say it is the cosine is a sum. This is the difference. That's the full. That, that number right there. This one's got a plus sign. That, however, I understand more. Yeah. We say it sums. And let me tell you about something else. And this is something that, um, <laughs> you know, there's so many little things as you go along learning your physics that you, you see this little funny thing along the side of the road. You go, oh, this is some dirty Kleenex. I won't look at it. But underneath is a, the, the diamond. And here, here's a, a diamond. What I do uh, here. Uh, Let's um, uh, go to uh, local control here. Uh, let me uh, fix it so that this thing is not quite the same. I'm going to do uh, a wave that's uh, not a sum uh, or a difference, but some uh, unequal number. Okay? Now what does it do? What does it do? It will move. It sits there, it catches its breath like a standing wave does, but then it gallops very rapidly across to this side, and then catches its breath, then gallops again. See this thing moving there, okay? Faster than light, that's al almost always faster than light. That's a galloping wave, okay? Now, we'll see those again, but this is how I got into that relativity business. I said, look at that thing. There's stuff in there going faster than light. And then it slows down. Then it speeds up again. So almost all of the waves that you can make, these are very special. 50-50 or 50 minus 50. Those are very special. That's a standing wave ratio of zero. This is a standing ratio of one to about... Um, maybe a sixth. So this is standing wave ratio of one to six, one sixth. This is standing wave ratio of six. Okay? So the ratio of this to this. This thing has to sneak through there uh, in every uh, half period. So you look at it, there it goes. Maybe uh, it helps uh, to crank up uh, the speed. I don't know if this does that. If I crank this up, will it? It keep the same frames. Go ahead and give it a whirl. It'll make it move faster, but it'll let it change. Yeah, let's see if it. 
maybe I can do it with this, right? Yeah, you can see. Every half period, it gallops. Catches, catches its breath, gallop. Catches its breath, gallop. Okay. Well, we wrote a paper about this called the Relativistic Properties of Galloping Waves. Oh, yeah. I'm very careful. Right? That's how we discovered a better way to teach relativity and quantum mechanics. Let waves give you the clues of what's going on. And when you look at this in a moving frame, you see pair creation and pair destruction of these zeros. Well, this is all stuff that's um, kind of weird. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things that um, you find lying along the side of the road and um, it's worth, worth uh, sometimes taking uh, use of that. Use of it. Now what we're going to do next, and I would say one of the things we should change on this control panel, this is a really important control tab, yeah. changing the number of oscillators. Yeah. It shouldn't be in the crowd, it should be right you know, up in the center there. But there's where you change the number of oscillators that you're going to be playing with right there. So let's crank up the uh, six uh, to that and see how she does. This is what we're going to be talking about next. And when we do our, our Fourier control, uh, these are the kind of waves that we're going to uh, be dealing with. Okay, There'll be the zero wave like you always had. There'll be the one wave like we were just looking at in combination with minus one. But now two wave uh, means something. It actually means something besides minus one. This is a very different wave now uh, according to these six phasers because if I only have three phasers, like here, here, and here, then I don't detect the differences uh, uh, located here and here. You see, this one does. So this is more, the sixth the six wave is more discriminative of the various Fourier components. And that's what we're going to work with uh, uh, next. So let's uh, bit back here to uh, the um, lectures. And um, we don't need to say anything more about that. We're going uh, to do uh, C6 the same way, but now we're going to zip through it uh, real quick uh, just to get a feeling for, first of all, what we already have done, which is, is make a character, uh, a group multiplication table, and then a set of matrices that represent each element of the group. And then we're going to do the same thing with our Hamiltonian or our K matrix. We're going to write it as a linear combination of operations. And it'll be clearer from this example where this goes and what it works on. Uh, the only Parker? sad thing about this is that it's hard to see some of the colors here. Uh, so I'm going to let Lewis look at this thing from yes, a better point. Quick question. Uh, the six, uh, in C6, does that stand for the degrees of freedom, the, the number of in? That you're considering? Yeah. Uh, what do you call instead of instead of a qubit? This is a sex bit. Oops. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sexagonal bit. <laughs> I, I mean, what do you call it, right? Um, <laughs> uh, the C stands for circle or cyc cyclic. I guess. And um, the number is is just exactly what it has as, 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 as a degree of freedom, right? So we are already thinking about a hexagon here. It, it, and um, that will be obvious in, in, in just a, a minute here. So um, let, the, these particular slides in this thing are sequential. So this comes directly out of um, le lecture uh, 12 of the group theory, OK? And so I will just follow them in sequence. And the rule is the same. The matrix for R cubed is gotten by putting a 1 in a 0 matrix wherever R cubed shows up. Here, here, here. And it's very cyclical. That's why it's called a cyclical group. After you get done there, then you start up here, here, and here. 
So th there is the uh, matrix that represents the uh, middle operator of the of the uh, hexagonal cyclic sixth group. Okay. Same thing for r fourth or r squared. Or let's look at r. It's got all ones right down the diagonal here. Right down the diagonal are, are the little r's the first power. And then there has to be an r to the first power up in the corner. So there it is. Does that make clear what these things do? And of course, this guy, r to the zeroth, we've arranged them so the inverses of the operators here are sitting in that order up here. Now we say I could do a different kind of ordering. I put it th this one down here, and we'll talk about that later. That's a very powerful thing of the duality theorem that we'll be getting later on. But right now, uh, always get a one on the diagonal from this table. So the Hamiltonian is going to have these constants that use the same basic notation as the r's to a power, except they're written uh, sort of covariant. These are the contravariants. There's a little complex, in general, number, r1, r2, and finally rn minus 1. And the idea is that we are now a sufficient number of, of um, bits, sex bits, to uh, describe all cyclic groups. We don't have to go do C7 or C8. Um, we, we will understand uh, their behavior uh, pretty much just from looking at this, this example. Okay, now here's, here's what's funny about this, is that these coefficients, the uh, uh, italic r 1 through 5, or 0 through 5, or 1 through 6, if we're doing it um, the way a lot of books do. But remember, I like to count from 0, and so do a lot of other people that make progress on things. The uh, little coefficients represent springs of, a, a, say, a molecule. Okay? These guys, right? And the R1s are just the nearest neighbor couplings. This has more than that. This has more than just the sides of the hexagon that represents its symmetry. And right now we're just going to discuss the cases where the R's are all real. Okay, so that I I want to make uh, clear, but um, I go ahead and put the uh, the conjugate R's in there. There's R bar, R bar, R bar, R bar there. Those are the connections going one direction. The R's are a connection going the other direction. And right now we're going to say that they're equal. So conjugation symmetry requires just by having this matrix, that the purple R's, that's R5, uh, should be the complex conjugate of R1. So if they're not equal, they have to be complex conjugates of each other in order to have a Hermitian Hamiltonian that conserves probability. If you don't do this, uh, your probability is going to either grow exponentially or die exponentially. Okay, or it might do both. Pieces of it will go this way, and others will go uh, that way. So you you got a mess if you don't make a uh, Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay, but we do not have to have them equal like I've shown them here. Uh, that's what we'll do first. This is the way we uh, uh, had it uh, set up before with C3, and that's all we had to work with. Well, now we've got next neighbor. neighbor okay, so there's a space for S's. Uh, here and they have the same thing that the uh, R2 has to be conjugate of R4 in order to get a Hermitian Hamiltonian. But maybe they're equal, then we don't even argue about this and we just set it equal to minus s and call it a real number. And we're not done yet. There's also the T's, which are crosstown uh, spring hookups, as opposed to next nearest neighbor gives you a star of David there. This one just gives you the diameters of a hexagon and two diatomic or three diatomic uh, C2 things. This one gives you two uh, uh, triangles, C3 things, of sort of sitting there independent of each other if that's all you had. Uh, if you add them all up though, you've got a really 
pretty complicated animal, as we'll see. So this is where uh, we look at now the first step in cyclic symmetry, and it's going to be the first step in all of our group theory, is to express the H as a, as a combination of group operators that satisfy some multiplication of a group table. Second step, find the eigenfrequencies of H by spectral resolution of this combination. Okay, and then the third step is make that into a dispersion function and discuss, discuss the dynamics and there's all kinds of things that I think we're going to be running out of time on before we really get to discuss it. So we'll have to rush a bit there. But anyway, we're going to be able to diagonalize this age by simply spectrally resolving uh, each one of these elements. Well, every one of those elements is going to be a particular sixth root of unity. A first sixth root, a second sixth root, and a third uh, root, and then minus uh, these two. That will account for six uh, different projectors. And uh, as I say here, this is something. Groups know their roots. Does it, remember the one we call roots? Okay, well, the groups know it too. Okay. The, uh, you have to ask them nicely. <laughs> okay, then they'll tell you all this stuff. Really got to be nice. No bullies. Got to go gently into the night. Okay, so here's the basic idea: is we know that we're going to have six projectors corresponding to each of the six uh, roots here. So we might as well write them down. I'll use character notation. That is, the chi and the d will be equal, but it'll be the conjugate of what we would call a wave function psi. And this is going to be a, a, a standard practice. Uh, convention uh, throughout this thing. Now the group table that I, I just showed you that goes with this, which is over here, and I guess I should be moving it over for Lewis here fairly quickly. Are you able to look at it on your computer? Yeah. The, so, yeah. Uh -huh. um, I'll keep it for a moment like this. We take this complicated group table and reduce it to this when we make projectors. Projectors are item potent. P squared is equal to P, but zero with everybody else, right? They're orth orthonormal, right? So this is what it really amounts to when you make your um, or your projectors. The, as I say, the top row flip is not needed because they are their own conjugate. So you don't have to do this thing where you put the inverses on the top and the elements on the side. These things are just the way it's shown. Okay, so you reduce your your uh, multiplication table to, to this. Now, if it's a sum of projectors, then it is just the unit matrix that you get. So, here are the matrices representing uh, each of those uh, p's from this table, just as we got each of these things from looking at this table for the group elements themselves. Isn't that slick? That's, you know, getting at it directly, right? Just going for it directly by knowing the projectors are eigenvalue placeholders. Here's where the eigenvalues are going to go, right? So your linear combinations of them are going to be things that um, are spectral decompositions, basically. This is the rules they follow. And they satisfy completeness rule. So simple, right? Such a simple algebra compared to what you would do with Dirac quant, um, you know, vectors, which is the other way of handling uh, this sort of stuff. Like this is superior. And there's our character table. That's what it uh, looks like. Now, I'm going to go ahead on this one, just go through it again. There's uh, three possibilities for uh, uh, couplings. There's the projectors, there's the uh, character tables, there's C6 in all its glory. Okay. With the uh, carefully uh, denoted uh, psi uh, star is what we call a character. The star of the wave function are what we make a plot here. So these are actually um, 
instead of being e to the minus k, uh, what we're doing here, these, the, the plain wave function is e to the plus kx. Okay? But the characters are e to the minus kx. That's what, uh, if you look up any character table, almost all of them just come out that way. Uh, it's, nobody it's, uh, tells you why it is. And remember, all of these phasers have the real axis up, okay, and the imaginary axis this way. And wherever that clock hand is, you have to go back to the real axis to actually tell where it is. And that's the way where the wave is at that particular um, for that particular uh, one mod six uh, uh, eigenfunction. Now, if you want wave function, you do have to have the radical. And then the lattice uh, equation is down here for this. Okay? So, um, I think I can go ahead and uh, show. Now, what I say here is this is what you'll get if you, um, as I say, go to the library, look up a group theory book, look for the character C6. You'll get a table that looks like that. And that's all you've learned in an ordinary group theory book. That's why I got called the group and pest. Nobody, you know, put the physics on it. Show what it really is. It's a list of eigenfunction waves. Those are the points, powers, P, P, P numbers. There's the M numbers right there, modulo 6. These are P's modulo 6. Okay, so we got modular arithmetic, sexonary, hexonary, whatever you want to call it. Okay, and um, that is the, the way it is. Now, um, this is the way the characters used to look, and that's kind of what you'll see in that old textbook, because computing is a bit. This is the this is our wonderful new stuff here. What's really fun is to push this a little bit. There's C7. Okay, nobody want, show, you won't find a character table for C7. There it is. Okay, the numbers are kind of funny. Okay, 7 is a weird number. C8, that, that looks pretty much like C4 done over. Here is so in, 24. So, so Dr. Hunter, so it means here you will have, you will calculate the seventh root of unity of your form. Mm -hmm. Or nth root of unity. And then seven. displace them accordingly. You see, you've got to be careful how you lay them out. But every one of those uh, things has to be a 7 through, have to represent a 7 through. Yeah. So notice, for example, here, okay, there's 1 modulo 24. This is 0 modulo 24. This is 1 mod 24. This is 2 waves modulo 24. This is 3, kind of 1, 2, 3 waves modulo 4. Meanwhile, coming from the bottom, okay, and this is a little hard to see. I maybe can see it better if I go over here onto this screen and show that. Uh, I think you, you can see that down here I have a one wave. There's the peak, there's the valley, and then there's the peak again. It's just that they're arranged uh, differently from this one right here. Okay, we're kind of backwards, right? Well, this is minus 1 modulo 24. That's plus 1 modulo 24 there. Then here's 2 waves modulo 24. This is minus 2. It's 22 modulo 4 is minus 2. See the 24 kink wave in there all hitting in the right places? But the arrows, if you follow, just look at the arrows, there's half a wave, there's one, I'm halfway now, I do it again, it's just almost like this one. It's the conjugate of this one, okay? And then what's called the Brouillon band boundary, BBB, it's right here. It's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. This is the only real wave uh, here, only standing wave here besides this one, which is zero. So this is the extent of the K space out to the first Brillion band boundary. And that will include these. You have to fold this thing in half, right? Here's the fold point. 
so the arrows in each of those little circles does that denote the orientation of um, face the face of that particular of that wave of that wave right. okay. yes and then they're going to turn at whatever frequency the eigenvalue tells them to turn, right? And that's going to be the dispersion function, okay? And this is going to go on and on. Here we are at 32. It's a few more of them, right? Here's 100. Let's go for it. 256. Isn't that gorgeous? Now, what, why are you seeing a bunch of hyperbolas? You see them here and here, you see them there and there. And that's because it's e to the i mode integer times power or point integer, mp. That's k sub m r to the p's power. That's, that's kx right there. This is just writing it in terms of the numbers we're used to, each of them divided by the total number 256 but this MP this is the M number along the side here going from 1 to 256 and these uh, phasers are so small the the pixel uh, washes them out but you can see the hyperbola and that's just MP equal constant you know I think I mentioned it before but these Patterns look like when you, when you, like the old TVs. Equilateral hyperbolas. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But then at, at uh, you know, points that are rational connections, this is, you know, these are the kind of waves that made those funny revivals, right? You're kind of seeing they're, they're doing something in their own Fourier transform matrix. That's what this is. This is a Fourier transform matrix of dimension 256. It's a heck of a lot more beautiful than just writing e to the i k x, right? That's what it is, e to the i k x. This is k, that's x. Okay, well, I would point out that this sort of analysis is very much a part of that um, uh, QCA QTCA book, uh, Unit 3 uh, through uh, eight, the chapters 8 through 9. We just imagine a, a beam that has, say, six channels, and there's a, uh, a place where the uh, beam polarization gets changed, and then it goes on, and you just play with those things to understand some of the things about quantum mechanics. But here's where you display all the eigen solutions possible for a uh, and you should point, you should be aware of what it is we've done here. What we have done here is build it so that not only do you have an easy way to find eigenfunctions of a Hamiltonian, but you're also describing all possible Hamiltonians of that symmetry. All possible eigenfunctions of all possible Hamiltonians. And if that's the case, that means you can make an orthocomplete equation for the eigenvalues, and that's what comes up here fairly quickly. But I'm going to go through that only very quickly. This is something um, we'll make use some use of this. Here are the dispersion functions for the nearest neighbor, elementary block model. But here's a second neighbor. If you only had second neighbors, you'd get this. And if you only had third neighbors, you'd get three. So what those coefficients r0, r1, r a uh, two and R three R is <laughs> it <laughs> is uh, Fourier components of the dispersion function. That's kind of neat. The actual Fourier components of the dispersion function are the these coupling constants. There's the first Fourier coefficient. There's the second coefficient. There's the third that makes a three-wave dispersion. So the dispersion function can have those as Fourier components. So that means you can make complete sets. And here I'm setting the gauge to zero, so these are all real. There are then four different eigenvalues that you're going to get, and there are four different uh, constants that you're going to set. They all have to be real, so you can cut it down. It's orthocomplete. Okay? Now you make a complex, okay, so that you have complex phase 
associated with each one of those, that's three more numbers, now you've got a six by six of display. And I left as an exercise to find the R's as a function of the um, uh, eigenvalues. This is the eigenvalues as a function of R's. That would make some, most people happy. But you can go backwards. It's solving six simultaneous equation, linear equations that you want to. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. With general coefficients. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, right. So your R0, R1, everything will be function will be functions of omega sub zero, omega plus one, whatever, times some phase factors. That's what these will be. Yeah. Yeah. And here's what it, it kind of looks like. If you have uh, dispersion functions that's uh, real, it looks like that. Okay. Just <clears> solving <throat> for an inverse matrix for a CC yes. character table. That's the point. You can make orthocomplete solutions. All possible problems, all possible solutions. I'll show you here. Here's what happens with just making R1 uh, um, imaginary, that is making it have a, a, an angle phi. The little hexagon that projects our uh, dispersion before, it rotates by half that, by, by in this case pi over 12 is the angle I picked. So look what happens when that happens. These two were degenerate before they split the first order. The top one just moves to second order. The bottom one moves slightly to second order. But these two split. So you got Zeeman splitting here and you have quadratic Zeeman right there. And it's all just due to the geometry of taking a cosine wave and moving it a little bit uh, to the right or to the left. That's what I call a gauge effect. And it just amounts to putting a magnetic field uh, up the axis of the hexagon or to rotating it. If you rotated this thing while it was doing these waves, uh, it would do this. So, so that's kind of neat. There you can see uh, what uh, is happening uh, to all of the uh, lives. So here, now, every wave has to be a moving wave. It has to be a current carrying type of symmetry. Everyone, you can't have these degenerate degeneracy where you can make a standing wave. You can't make a standing wave. That's one of the things that will happen if you think. Because it's already moving. <laughs> you can say, well, maybe I'll make it go fast enough sort of thing. But only one mode would do that. And here's another thing. Now that you can make um, any possible dispersion function, that's what this is doing here. I can make a quadratic uh, dispersion. I see, this is the dispersion I'm, I'm stuck with. If I just use blocks uh, thing with only one coupling, but in general, I can put in uh, all those cross couplings. I can make anything you want. And if I was talking about n equals six, I'd need to have a minus two for the nearest neighbor, a two thirds for next nearest, and finally a minus a half for the cross town. That's nice. Then I can get the, the, the Bohr dispersion. And remember what the Bohr dispersion does? It revives. It's a subset of a harmonic oscillator, so it revives. <coughs> Okay, I think that's uh, as far as we're going to go. That's the last slide right there. Blank. We'll, uh, as I said, come back uh, and look a little bit more at uh, the unitary guys, U2. Go back up to the top, look at the two, the two, and then we'll carry that forward a bit on the next lecture. <clears throat> okay.